edition of the fall 2022 season of the Medical History Interest Group Lecture Series. I'm Jennifer Darty, the North Carolina Collection Librarian for ECU's Academic Library Services. The Medical History Interest Group presentations are sponsored as part of the Ruth and John Moskip Lecture Series and the Lopez Library History Collections. If you haven't already done so, um, please sign in the attendance sheet before you leave. It's right over there. Um, and there are res refreshments available on the other side of the wall. Please help yourself. And that's where um, people viewing it virtually miss out because we have there's some really good hot cider over there. Um, so we have uh, they have several history exhibits on display today. Um, here on the fourth floor, there is a pop up exhibit related to today's lecture featuring U.S. government doc documents. Um, related to today's topic, as well as Soviet Union propaganda cartoons on alleged U.S. bioweapons. There's also um, scientists and their microscopes, which shows various microscopes in the collection with images of well-known scientists who use the same versions in their research. And then on the second floor of the library, to commemorate the 300 years since the pirate Blackbeard's adventures around North Carolina, there's the plague of piracy. The exhibit includes photos and artifacts cast replicas on loan from the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology and the Queen Anne's Revenge Lab. It is complemented with artifacts from the Country Doctor Museum. Um, so today, the presenter is Dave Durant, who is the Associate Professor of Federal Documents and Social Sciences Librarian for Academic Library Services. Um, Dave holds an AB in History, a Master's in Library and Information Sci Services, from the University of Michigan and an MA in Russian and Soviet history from the University of California, Los Angeles. So here is Dave with a favorite pastime, disease and disinformation in the Cold War. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction. Thank you very much for all of you taking the time to be here today. And thanks to all of you who are joining us online. Um, yes, is uh, my presentation, as was said, a favorite pastime. There will be, you will, this title will be explained in a few minutes. Disease and disinformation in the Cold War. Essentially, uh, charges, counter charges, allegations, and outright disinformation regarding outbreaks of disease and incidents or alleged incidents of biological warfare actually played a substantial part in the propaganda and information struggle between the U.S. and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So what I'm going to do is kind of highlight a few of those key incidents and also just talk about a little bit at the end about their contemporary relevance in terms of contemporary medical misinformation and disinformation such as regard especially COVID-19 but not exclusively and uh, <clears throat> kind of reference briefly how this, these efforts, especially from the Soviet side in particular, contributed to the spread of, of medical misinformation that still affects us today. Not the only cause, but a contributing factor. Uh, so here are basically the five main areas of my presentation. I'm gonna talk a little bit just for context about the broader political propaganda and information struggle, psychological warfare versus what's been called active measures. I'm gonna talk about the first major instance of such disease-related allegations during the Cold War, which were involved the, which were part of the Korean War and its propaganda struggle. I'll explain it in a minute. And then several various charges and counter charges, not at all means an exhaustive list, just a few hand-picked examples to kind of give you a sense and set the stage for those of you who maybe have a little bit of familiarity with this topic and are expecting me to talk about, which is, of course, something called Operation Denver. And I will get to that, of course. That will kind of be the piece de resistance. And then finally, a postscript to further cheer you up. Now, psychological warfare versus active measures. There's lots of talk about active measures. I've engaged in a little bit of it myself in terms of my previous presentations and sort of popularizing work. But uh, I wanted to talk a little bit at first about psychological warfare, which is what the US called its efforts to engage in information and propaganda during the Cold War, especially the early part of the Cold War. 
It started in the late 1940s, and this this is the definition definition, excuse me, from a CIA uh, document from March 1948 that kind of defines psychological warfare, psychological operations outside the United States in its possession and its possessions for the purpose of undermining the strength of foreign instrumentalities where the government organizations or individuals engage in activities inimical to the United States and to support United States foreign policy by influencing public opinion abroad in a direction favorable to the attainment of United States objectives. So essentially the efforts of the United States to influence foreign public opinion and in some ways boost uh, friendly governments and friendly organizations, institutions around the world, and to, in some cases, undermine hostile governments, organizations, and institutions. Uh, this is a little bit more. This is from a famous document called NSC, National Security Council Directive 68, United States Objectives and Programs for National Security. This was sort of like the lodestone document in terms of how America approached the Cold War from its very beginning, dated April 14th, 1950, just two months before the Korean War started. Just talking about building programs to strengthen confidence among other peoples and us and to tear down their confidence and their beliefs in the Soviets, and including by covert means as well as overt. So as, as I said, influencing public opinion by the United, efforts by the United States to influence foreign public opinion. And it involved both overt means such as Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, US Information Agency, but also, but also sometimes it was done covertly through the CIA, especially through the from the 19, late 1940s through the 1960s primarily. Things like funding media outlets, civil society groups, engaging in political interference in elections, propaganda, information outreach. And there was a category that the CIA called black psych psyops, black psychological warfare, which involved things like forgeries. This was done on a certain scale, primarily through the late 1950s. Uh, covert psychological warfare, as I said, the CIA began to abandon it by the late 1950s and it became much more of an overt, kind of what the US does now in terms of influencing civil society groups through overt funding and things like that. So the, the idea of covert methods was abandoned by the late 1950s. Open and licit methods were what, were what were primarily approved of. Now, active measures, the Soviet counterpart, which is a phrase you've probably, you might well have come across uh, in the last seven years or so, six years, I would say. Before that, it was basically been relegated to a footnote of Cold War history. The use of essentially propaganda and disinformation and just information operations in general to advance Soviet interests and undermine the interests of the Soviet Union's adversaries. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union's adversaries, number one at the on top of that list, called officially the main enemy or main adversary was the United States. So the US was the main target of Soviet active measures during the Cold War. Active measures included a variety of methods, including provocations, uh, actions that were made to, uh, I'll give you a quick example. When, when, when the NATO was discussing adding West Germany as a member in the late 1950s, the Soviet Union organized a campaign through the KGB where KGB officers, first in West Germany and then even here in the United States and elsewhere, would infiltrate Jewish cemeteries at night and paint swastikas on Jewish gravestones to remind people or sort of remind people, hey, these guys are just Nazis. You shouldn't have them in NATO. So that's an example of a provocation. And of course, false and misleading information, what's come to be dubbed fake news, uh, forgeries were all part of active measures. And of course, influencing the target audience, both public and decision makers. And the term active measures from, as this quote points out from a 2017 report, came into use in the Soviet Union in the 1950s to describe overt and covert techniques for influencing events and behavior in foreign countries. Disinformation, the deliberate peddling of false information 
is part of that, but it's not the it's not the entirety of active measures. It's just one method for carrying it out. So you have active measures, in particular, desinformatia, disinformation, the peddling of false information is part of it. That became those efforts had always been there, but in the late 1950s, just as the US was moving away from the more unsavory methods of psychological warfare, the Soviet Union started to embrace them on a much more comprehensive scale. Uh, inside the KGB, what had been called, what had been renamed in 1954, the KGB, you had a department that was formed in the first main directorate, which handled foreign intelligence, exclusively designed just to conduct active measures. In 1962, this became known as Service A. The man who was in charge of Service A, who was essentially its founder and head of it for many years, General Ivan Aguiantz, is pictured here. And it wasn't just the KGB, the, quote, fraternal services of the Soviet Union, uh, secret police from the German Democratic Republic, i.e. East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Cuba, Bulgaria, their allied satellite services also were keenly involved in the propagation of active measures. Uh, so active measures essentially start, essentially began, they had always been around, but they began really under that name and in earnest in the late 1950s, intensified strongly by the mid 1960s. By 1985, Service A was spending three to four, an estimated three to four billion dollars a year on active measures. And by that time, uh, many of the people in the KGB thought they were they were winning the Cold War, essentially. And so it came as quite a shock, the events of the next five or six years. And in terms of, uh, I mentioned fraternal services, and here's a quote from one of these fraternal services. And if you're wondering where I got that title from, our friends in Moscow call it desinformatia. Our enemies in America call it active measures. And I, dear friends, call it, quote, my favorite pastime. The words of Oberst Rolf Wagenbrett, director of Department 10, that's a Roman numeral 10, the of the HFA, which was the foreign intelligence arm of East Germany's Ministry for State Security, as we all know at the Stasi. And so Department 10 was their version of the KGB Service A. It was the, the Department of the HFA that was responsible for uh, conducting active measures, often in, usually in cooperation with the KGB and other Eastern European intelligence services. Uh, we'll be coming back to Oberst Wagenbrett and his colleagues in a few minutes. They do have a role to play. So, moving on to the first instance of uh, the first major incident of disease and disinformation, of disinformation and uh, propaganda related to outbreaks of disease or alleged outbreaks of disease in the Cold War. The first one relates to the Korean War. Uh, false alarm, communist allegations of biological warfare in Korea. During the Korean War, started in 1950, hostilities ended in 1953, though technically it's officially, legally never ended. China, Korea, and then supported by the Soviet Union claimed that the US engaged in widespread use of biological warfare against China and North Korea. The US, of course, denied the charges. Uh, to understand the nature of the charges, I want to get a very brief bit of background. A Japanese organization from called Unit 731. I don't know how many of you may have heard of Unit 731. This was an infamous, if you're at all familiar with the history of biological warfare or experimentation, Unit 731 is quite infamous. They they were one of a number of Japanese organizations are the largest and most well known that engaged in biological warfare experimentation and use from 1931 to 45, 32 to 45, excuse me. They committed horrific crimes involving ex gruesome experiments on the effect of disease on the human body, and they engaged in use of biological warfare against, the Chinese, against China during World War II. To some historians estimate that as many of a quarter million Chinese may have been killed by Japanese use of BW during World War II. 
Uh, the U.S. shamefully did not prosecute the leaders of Unit 731 who it captured. Instead, it essentially gave them a sort of quiet amnesty in return for them providing the information they, uh, they had access to about their program and about what they discovered. This, the Soviets knew this, and they made great hay of it in their propaganda in the late 1940s. They themselves captured 12 members of Unit 731 and put them on trial in late 1949 in the city of Khabarovsk in the Soviet Far East. And all 12 were, of course, convicted, though none of them were sentenced to death. In fact, instead of being sent to the Gulag, they were sent to a relatively comfortable dacha or country house somewhere near Moscow, not too far from one of the main Soviet VW research facilities. But nonetheless, they made a great show of this trial and they used it to embarrass the United States and Japan. So the trial was itself a form of information warfare, even though in many ways, these were people who deserved to be convicted for their crimes. So the activities of Unit 731 essentially would provide a basis for many of the allegations that the communist side would make regarding biological warfare during the Korean War. And these allegations would come in two main waves, the first one in 1952 and the larger, more substantial set of, 1951, excuse me, and the larger, more substantial set of allegations would come in 1952. Well, the Korean War, as I said, began in June 1950. The Chinese openly intervened in October, November 1950. The first wave of allegations came in the spring of 1951. The Chinese made propaganda references to Unit 731 and alleged that the U.S. was putting these people to work for engaging in, to engage in biological warfare on their behalf. And then in May, the North Korean foreign minister claimed that the U.S. forces, when they were treated from North Korea the previous winter, left behind uh, smallpox with them, deliberately left behind items contaminated with smallpox so as to cause a smallpox outbreak in North Korea. The allegations eventually subsided after a few weeks, but then in February 1952, the second larger campaign began. Uh, February 22nd, North Korea and China began co a coordinated effort of accusations that the U.S. was engaged in extensive biological warfare. In this case, it was that the U.S. was flying hundreds of aircraft missions, were flying hundreds of missions in which they dropped insects, disease-bearing insects, such as mosquitoes and fleas and spiders and rodents, carrying diseases such as anthrax, plague, and cholera, dropping them in North Korea, dropping them in northeastern China and Manchuria. And so, and well, the reason I, I mentioned that is because these methods were very much the methods the Japanese used in World War II when they used biological warfare against China. So that Unit 731 kind of, those allegations, well, the reality of what they did kind of was used to kind of provide fodder for this campaign, a sort of, I'm going to use this term again, I think I may be the first person who's coined this term, a sort of active measure cinematic universe, where all these themes and campaigns kind of tie together and they, and you'll, you'll see this pattern again. So yeah, I think I'm the first person to come up with that. But uh, so as evidence, the Chinese and the North Koreans produced evidence such as insects, such as these fleas, Please in a test tube, how much more how much more convincing do you need? Uh, and also leaflet bombs that the U.S. had used that they claimed were used to drop these these disease bearing insects. Uh, captured U.S. airmen publicly confessed to taking part in biological warfare missions. Of course, these confessions that turned out were coerced and brought about through coercion and often torture. There were two communist-sponsored committees, uh, international committees sponsored by China, North Korea, and the Soviet Union that came to China and North Korea, or primarily to China, investigated these charges, and in both cases, they pronounced the charges. They said, we believe the Chinese and North Koreans. They validated these charges. Uh, when the U.S. pushed for an investigation by the International Red Cross, for example, or the World Health Organization, the Chinese and Soviets opposed it. And so no such investigation happened. And one thing to keep in mind is that 
this campaign, this active measures, as it would come to be called campaign, was used by Mao to mobilize the Chinese population, not just in support of the, Korea, the effort in Korea or in support of his, the Chinese communist regime, which had only been established in 49, but all, or not just to rally anti-American sentiment, but in terms of engaging in public health measures. So you had this widespread public health and vaccination campaign that went along with these allegations in China. And it was like, you know, by getting a vaccination, you're, you know, you're defying the Yankee disease bearing Yankee imperialists and that sort of thing. So the Soviet Union soon echoed these charges. Uh, much of the European left and many in the developing world embraced these, were convinced by these charges or embraced them. The U.S., of course, vehemently denied these charges, as did as did its allies and most Western scientists who looked at the who looked at the evidence that had been provided, like primarily through the the film and uh, pictures of this evidence, and said, "No, this is nonsense." Gradually, when the Korean War ended, the issue gradually faded, and it became sort of a footnote to history again. But you know, the charges, most historians in the West remain convinced that it was uh, false. China and North Korea continue to insist to this day that it was true. But there were some archival documents and memoirs released in China and the Soviet Union in the 1990s that show pretty conclusively that the charges were false and knowingly made false, knowingly false. Uh, there were genuine fears at first among the Chinese and North Koreans that the U.S. was doing this. But then when they realized that these there was nothing there, they kept the charge, they kept the campaign going for propaganda purposes. So again, uh, they once they realized it was once they realized it was false, they made it they became an open overt lie that they embraced for their own purposes. So here's a quote from the head of Chinese military medical services in Korea, a memoir he penned in 1997 that was published briefly in China by a publication that was soon put out of business, soon closed down, and then has been republished on the website of the Wilson Center in DC. Uh, so our preliminary investigation could not, still could not prove that the US military carried out bacteriological warfare. I'll just leave you with kind of his bottom line. And then here's a, a document that the Soviet May 1953, like two months after the death of Stalin, the Soviet leadership sent to Mao Zedong. Uh, essentially, Stalin's henchmen turned successors to borrow the famous phrase of, Cap of Claude Rains' as Captain Renault in Casablanca. They were shocked, shocked to find deception going on here. Soviet government and the Central Committee of the CPSU, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, were misled spread in the press of information about the use by the Americans of bacteriological weapons in Korea was based on false information. The accusation against the Americans were fictitious. So this was a resolution they passed. And so, I mean, this wasn't released publicly, of course, but this was them saying afterwards. And of course, Stalin wanted the Korean War to continue. And after he died, the rest of the leadership said, no, let's, let's bring this to a halt. So they, prevailed upon Mao to finally come to an armistice. So various charges and counter charges. We've, the Korean War allegations were the first major instance of sort of these disease and disinformation in terms of the broader information conflict of the Cold War. Now there were a number of charges and counter charges that continued throughout say the early 1980s. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple. And these are primarily gonna be from around the early 1980s. Again, especially from the Soviet side, there were a lot more, but I'm just going to highlight the Soviet ones in particular, just examples. A couple of the main U.S. allegations, and the U.S. didn't really make an issue of this during the 1970s, but under the Reagan administration, the U.S., of course, became more, took a more forceful stance towards the Soviet Union and calling out real or perceived or alleged Soviet actions regarding biological warfare was one of the one aspect of that. Again, this sort of renewed information warfare, so almost psychological warfare, like in the early days, but much more above board in this case. 
In April 1979, you had an outbreak of anthrax in the Soviet city of Sverdlovsk, now known as Yekaterinburg. The U.S. claimed that this outbreak was the result of an accident at a at an anthrax production facility in the city, a facility that was manufacturing anthrax for use in the Soviet biological warfare program. The Soviets denied this and said that this was all the result of just contaminated meat and that people, animals becoming infected, people ultimately eating those animals. And so it was just a natural ant outbreak of anthrax. Well, this was a major sort of a contra biomedical controversy during the 1980s. Uh, I've talked about this at length about almost three years ago, January 2020, called Accident Compound 19. I'm not going to rehash that. Safe to say when the Soviet Union fell in the end of the Cold War in 1991, it turned out that, yes, it was a biological warfare accident. So score one for the U.S. on that one. A more mixed result was the, were the allegations related to a phenomenon called yellow rain, which were there were these instances in Laos, uh, Cambodia and Southeast Asia and Afghanistan, where you had anti-Soviet or anti-communist rebels in the late 70s, early 80s. And there were a number of instances where they reported being attacked by this sort of yellow mist or yellow gas, and it produced things like vomiting and and uh, coughing and things like that. And the U.S. eventually gathered, tried to gather some evidence, and in the early 80s started to allege that this yellow rain, as it was dubbed, was a Soviet weapon. Essentially, some people called it chemical, some called it biological, but essentially a mycotoxin-based weapon. Uh, the evidence for this was never very substantial. Many people disputed it. And the evidence that the general consensus today is that these allegations were not true, that whatever this yellow rain was, there's one popular theory that it was actually like collective bee pollen droppings or something. I don't know if I'm convinced by that, but the evidence that it was a Soviet biological weapon seems to be very thin and most people don't, most People who've studied this, most specialists and experts don't believe that. So that one would, we would probably call false. And then, of course, there were just general allegations that the Soviets were violating the 1972 Biological Warfare Convention, which required both the U.S. and Soviet Union to get rid of all their biological weapons. And again, this one, even though some of the details may not have been true, the general picture was, yes, the Soviets were doing exactly that. In fact, over the course of the 1970s and 80s, the Soviet Union, having pledged to rid itself of biological weapons, was built the largest, most deadly biological arsenal in history. So that one generally would be true. Now, Soviet charges and counter charges, and there were many of these. And again, the U.S. charges, even when they weren't always true, at least there was an attempt to have some basis for them. It wasn't just made up out of whole cloth. The Soviets had no such qualms in terms of their charges. Uh, so anytime a disease outbreak occurred in any kind of Soviet bloc or Soviet allied nation, it was invariably, almost invariably accused of being the result of a CIA plot to engage in biological warfare. An example of this is 1981, there was a dengue fever outbreak in Cuba. And it was alleged that this was a result by the Cuban government, echoed by the Soviets, that this was a result of you know, CIA machinations. It seems highly unlikely. And then uh, a second major theme was the claim, the consistent claim that any U.S. effort to fund biological research anywhere in the world, especially outside the United States, was essentially being done for nefarious biological warfare purposes to sort of cultivate diseases and means of spreading those diseases and then unleash those diseases on the unsuspecting populations of that country or neighboring and or neighboring countries. And a good example of this, and that's where this rather interesting drawing is from, in February 3rd, 1982, a Soviet publication called Literaturnaya Gazeta published an article by an author named Yona Andronov. 
and this is the illustration that went with that drawing. Uh, he visited, he snuck into a Soviet university, excuse me, a American, a University of Maryland funded biological research facility in the city of Lahore in Pakistan. And he told this incredible story about how he infiltrated the place and you know, found it was being used to craft all sorts of diseases like encephalitis. And they were breeding mosquitoes there and they're gonna unleash these mosquitoes on Pakistan and Afghanistan and spread encephalitis and other diseases. And in fact, they even tied this back to the dengue fever up outbreak in Cuba. They said the mosquitoes from this Lahore facility may have been the source of that. So again, that active measure cinematic universe concept, which again, I think I may have just coined, but anyway. So this one was actually successful, the Lahore campaign, because it actually struck a nerve in Pakistan at that time. The head of the facility, the US research scientist in charge of the Lahore facility, which was funded by the University of Maryland, was actually expelled from Pakistan because of these charges. So that's how seriously they were taken. So it actually paid a struck, and the more these campaigns worked, the more the Soviets and the KGB kept at it and kept trying to expand them and tie them into other other propaganda themes and so on. But both of these themes were really nonsense. And finally, this sort of sets the stage for something called Operation Denver, which you may have heard of, which aids the KGB and the Stasi, or in this case, HFR 10, uh, Oberst Wagenbrett and his colleagues, as I mentioned earlier. During the mid-1980s, the KGB and its Eastern European partners mounted a major effort to prove, prove, or to at least allege, to convince a large part of the world that the AIDS virus was created in a U.S. biological research laboratory. They called it a biological warfare facility at Fort Detrick, Maryland. So the first, even before the first KGB efforts in this regard, there were conspiracy theories regarding the origins of AIDS um, and, and HIV hadn't been discovered yet, but you know, AIDS, you know, is this new mysterious deadly disease in the early 1980s and it affected certain populations primarily, like gay men primarily, uh, blood, blood donors and blood recipients, uh, Haitians, intravenous drug, Haitian immigrants, intravenous drug users, those populations were the ones very disproportionately affected by, by AIDS. And so there was in particular in the early 80s, a gay writer and activist in Boston, I believe based in Boston named Charles Shively, who first is the first person on record as propagating the belief that AIDS was created by the US government. So that belief was already out there, it kind of circulated on its own, but it wasn't very widespread. The first instance of the KGB propagating that kind of propaganda theory about AIDS was in July of 1983, an Indian newspaper called The Patriot, which essentially was owned by the KGB and used as an outlet for disinformation and other active measures, published an article claiming that the US was planning to bring AIDS to India, essentially. It tied into sort of the bio labs, the earlier bio labs, like in Lahore, the, the US is gonna engage in AIDS research in India, they're gonna bring it here and then they're gonna unleash it. This seems to have been a one-off article because it wasn't part of a broader campaign. It was a, a one-off regional oriented, trying to, again, influence public opinion in India that the US was engaged in biological warfare, creating diseases and unleashing them or, or through their incompetence, allowing them to be unleashed. It wasn't until the fall of 1985, September 7th, we, in particular, we have a, a record was found in the archives of the Bulgarian secret police, the Bulgarian secret services, a notification from the KGB that they are going to engage in a new active measures campaign regarding the origins of AIDS and asking or asking the Bulgarians for their support. And then we come back to our mosquito friends, Literaturnaya Gazeta, October 30th, 1985. They published an article called Panic in the West, 
which laid out again the the basics of the Fort Detrick thesis. This was created. AIDS was created in this laboratory. Uh, you know, just the basic thing. This disease is spreading. The U.S. created it. The U.S. military industrial complex created it, and then they let it escape. And now it's spreading up and down the throughout the U.S. And they don't know what to do, et cetera, et cetera. If you're wondering, I'll just briefly why Literaturnae Gazeta is so prominently featured. This is the second time I've referenced them. It's because it's the title means literary gazette, but essentially it was the KGB essentially ran it. It was a regular source for KGB information. And in those places where Literaturnae Gazeta had foreign branches, foreign offices, they were pretty much little KGB mini stations. So. Uh, and here's a quote from that September 7th memo from the KGB to Bulgarian state security. We are conducting a series of active measures in connection with the appearance in recent years in the USA of a new and dangerous disease, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, and a subsequent large scale spread to other countries. The goal of these measures is to create a favorable opinion for us abroad that this disease is the result of secret experiments with a new type of biological weapon by the secret services of the USA and the Pentagon that spun out of control. That's pretty much as good a summary as you'll find from their own, you know, their own in their own words, a summary of what they were trying to do. So this AIDS campaign, this active measures, we'll call it the Dietrich, Fort Dietrich campaign, spread. They, they continued to develop it over the course of 1986. The Soviets and their East European allies, the Bulgarians, the Czechs, and especially, as you'll see, the East Germans. Uh, a key point came in August and September 1986 when you had a meeting of the non-aligned movement in Harare, Zimbabwe. And the attendees of this movement found themselves the recipients of a free brochure. I've shortened the title. This isn't the full title. It was called AIDS, Not Out of Africa. And this brochure had at its heart a report from a pair of doctors named Jacob and Lily Siegel. And they were a pair of retired biologists living in East Germany, husband and wife, who argued and they essentially tried to make a scientific case for the KGB Fort Dietrich thesis. And this actually struck a chord because the idea that AIDS originated in Africa had just recently arisen in the previous year or two. And this aroused, there was a fair amount of resentment among many Africans about this thesis that you're trying to blame us for this. And so any argument that said, no, it was the West that did it, you know, struck a chord. And so to have a pair of scientists like Jakob and Lily Siegel making that case, this document, the circulation of this document uh, was a, uh, you know, was a milestone in that. So Jakob and Lily Siegel, they were living in East Germany. They were technically Soviet citizens. As I said, they were retired biologists and they were uh, longtime committed communists from like the 1930s on. So it's very much clear that they put uh, for them, ideology superseded science. I mean, they, they saw themselves as scientists, but their science was very much shaped by their ideology. So they believed this Fort Dietrich. They genuinely seemed to believe this Fort Dietrich thesis and had taken their own initiative in putting it forward. But they were aided and facilitated in doing so by HFA 10, our friend Oberst Wagenbrett, who you know, had a chance here to engage in his favorite pastime. They helped facilitate the Siegel's efforts to spread their thesis. In particular, it seems that they helped, they're the ones who helped publish and distribute this document at the non-aligned movement meeting in Zimbabwe. So the Siegel's were acting on their own as far as we can tell, but they were being encouraged, permitted, and facilitated to do so by the East German Stasi, in particular HFA 10, the, the active measures disinformation unit of it. And so over the course of from the fall of 85 through 86, 
HFR 10, especially through their connection with the Seagulls, played a major role working with the KGB and the Bulgarians in facilitating the Dietrich campaign, the Fort Dietrich campaign. In fact, they're the ones who called their effort Operation Denver starting in July of 1986. So this is a quote from HFR 10 to Bulgarian state security September of 1986 with the goal of exposing the dangers to mankind arising from the research, production, and use of biological weapons, and also in order to strengthen anti-American sentiments in the world and to spark domestic political controversies in the USA, the GDR side will present you with a scientific study and other materials that prove that AIDS originated in the USA, not in Africa, and that AIDS is a product of the USA's bioweapons research. So this is a... Uh, uh, it's almost certainly talking about the document that the Seagulls produced that was the basis of this leaflet distributed in Zimbabwe at the Non-Aligned non Movement Conference. So this thesis continued to spread, the Dietrich thesis. On October 26 of 86, the Sunday Express, a UK newspaper, published an AIDS article, that le an article about AIDS and its origins that leaned heavily on Siegel and his arguments, Jakob Siegel and his arguments. So very little attempt made, if any, to refute them in that article. So anytime Western media echoed these charges, it was a huge victory for the KGB and its allies because then they could cite them. It helped not just that they were spreading, but that they were spreading in Western media and the KGB would then cite that as saying, look, this is what this British newspaper is saying. They're saying the same thing. October 31st, you have the famous Izvestia cartoon that was on the earlier slide, and that is displayed, I believe, in three places out here on the, the table. The uh, evil American scientist handing the vial of AIDS to the evil American general in return for this massive sum of money. Obviously, a lot of nuances went into that cartoon. But uh, yes, that cartoon has kind of become the the face, the symbol of Operation Denver and the Dietrich campaign. So by the end of March of 87, moving along, the Soviet press had produced 12 articles and at least as many radio broadcasts, according to scholar Thomas Ridd, repeating the Dietrich disinformation effort. You know, AIDS was created at Fort Dietrich by the US government. And the claims continue to spread through the developing world alternative and even into mainstream Western media. The most egregious example being at the end of March, March 30th, 1987, when an AP article that sort of just quickly repeated a Soviet claim, summarized the Soviet claims, was picked up by the CBS Evening News. And this is what viewers saw when they watched the CBS Evening News that day. So yes. So just to summarize for those of you online, we're limited in how much we can distribute this video for copyright reasons. But uh, this was a broadcast from the, a brief clip from the CBS Evening News on March 30th, 1987. Dan Rather essentially giving a brief item, it was originally from the Associated Press, that summarized a Soviet article that essentially was relaying the Dietrich thesis, essentially in a quick 10, 15 second form. A Soviet military publication published an article saying that the AIDS virus was created at a US biological warfare laboratory. There's no hard evidence, but you know they'd make no effort to refute it. And they didn't ask for any US refutation, the US to comment on this piece. So it was just a very brief item. Now, this, you understand, was a huge, this has been called by scholar Thomas Frid sort of the high point of the Operation Denver, because this getting it repeated like that on the CBS Evening News, one of the major American newscasts, was a huge, huge thing for them. And yes, I had to leave in the Nutrigrain commercial because it makes me nostalgic for my youth. So. All right, there we go. Sorry, I wasn't, I could have played it again, but I decided not to. So the US strongly pushed back against the Dietrich campaign, the, the Dietrich campaign, the Dietrich thesis. And 
in early, the early 1980s, the Reagan administration had created this active measures working group, it was called, whose sole purpose built around the State Department office of, you know, the information, U.S. information agency and so on, whose main purpose was to push back against Soviet disinformation and active measures. And so in, over 86 and 87, one of their main priorities was pushing back against the Dietrich camp theme in Operation Denver. Finally, October 23rd, 1987, U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz, I believe, went to Moscow where he met with Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, Schultz essentially called him out about the Dietrich thesis and the Dietrich disinformation campaign. Uh, Gorbachev kind of took issue with it, but a few days later, the Soviet newspaper Izvestia published an article by two Soviet aid scholars, essentially refuting the Dietrich thesis, refuting the idea that it was, that AIDS was man-made, that it was made in a laboratory. Um, and so that kind of marked a key point where Operation Denver essentially, I wouldn't say that it, large, it largely went away, not entirely. It was still continued in a very sort of sub rosa fashion, but as a major emphasis of active measures, it went away. Because at that point, for whatever reason, we can explore this in the Q&A if you're interested. It was, however, replaced by the baby parts campaign, which is an allegation that rich Americans were paying to have uh, children from Central and South America abducted so they could harvest their organs for transplants. So there was always another campaign on the horizon, another active measures campaign. Postscript, the legacy of Cold War medical disinformation. So, Operation Denver, as short-lived as it was, only two years, foster a legacy of distrust of official medical knowledge and authorities still with us today. Again, it did not create this. Again, conspiracy theories, medical conspiracy theories, including about AIDS, were there long, were there before the KGB started to work, and they survived long afterwards. But I think the Siegel especially the Siegel thesis and the, the Dietrich campaign spread so far that it left, it helped facilitate the spread of these conspiracy theories. And, and the, uh, this conspiracy theory that the US government created AIDS is still widely believed in some quarters. Among others, you'll be shocked to hear one Kanye West is on record as believing it. Uh, and of course, among other things, this sort of, Conspir Once you believe in one conspiracy theory, it can serve as sort of a gateway, if you will, into other types of theories. Once you've accepted that way of looking at the world, it's just, you know, it's easy to, to go further down that rabbit hole. So you have that helped pave the way for our current contemporary environment of medical inf misinformation in terms of COVID and vaccines. Not, again, did not create it, but helped foster it in some ways. And post-Soviet Russia continues to pursue what can be called active measures to help further foster this environment, including on disease and medical research topics. The uh, Russian intelligence services and Russian state media have helped push conspiracy theories regarding H1N1, the Ebola virus, and of course, COVID and COVID vaccines. Uh, for example, there was an American conspiracy theorist named Wayne Madsen who coined a theory that H1N1 was man-made and it was like a conspiracy to like reduce population in the third world. And the uh, RT, the Russian television network, has had him on as a guest on a number of occasions. So not just creating these theories, but helping others, facilitating others who want to spread these theories as well. And the last thing I'll mention, again, this goes back to the famous, the, the flying mosquito image that I hope doesn't stay with you for too long, but uh, targeting US funded bio labs, again, that's still a constant. In particular, bio labs in former, former states that in states that formerly belonged to the Soviet Union. Uh, 
the U.S., in the wake of the end of the Cold War, introduced something called the Biological Threat Reduction Program, which is part of a broader initiative, basically designed to clean up the mess from the fall of the Soviet Union. Essentially, the, the collapse of the massive Soviet biological warfare program, instead of leaving all these facilities and all these individuals with know-how, just leave them out there. It was to try to sort of to put them to work. And so instead of they're starving and they decide, well, let's go to Iran or North Korea or Saddam Hussein's Iraq, I can make a good living there. They can stay in their home countries and use their abilities for good, if you will. So these threat reduction biological laboratories have been created in a number of former East, former Soviet countries, former Soviet states for the purpose of, of keeping that know-how and expertise, keeping it out of the wrong hands and of uh, helping in foster you know, peaceful biological research, scientific research in those countries. Uh, I don't know if you can remember as far back as January of this year, I, I struggled to do it, but at the very beginning of this year, there was some unrest in the Central Asian state of Kazakhstan, again, a former Soviet Republic, and there was some, there was a, one of these threat reduction US funded labs was there. And so the Russians circulated some mis disinformation saying that this laboratory was overrun by rioters. And of course, that it was engaged in all sorts of nefarious research. This is a screenshot from the Daily Mail, a British tabloid that kind of just echoed those charges. And it's like, they're basically Kazakh authorities say, no, this never happened but that never stopped active measure specials before. And then finally, I'll leave you with this quote. Over the past years, the Russian Federation has more than once raised the issue of the military biological activities conducted by the Pentagon and agencies within its jurisdictions in laboratories located far away from the United States on the Russian border and the post-Soviet countries. Evidence and materials acquired during the special military operation have revealed the true nature of U.S. military biological activities in Ukraine. The analysis of these materials has shown that the United States and Ukraine violated the provisions of the Convention on the Prohibition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically, this has been one of the themes of Russian propaganda since they invaded Ukraine, that there are the, these U.S.-funded biological research labs are basically just warfare facilities, biological warfare facilities aimed at targeting Russia. And so this has been one of their, this was a statement from the Russian foreign ministry that was released all of three weeks ago, October 27th, 2022. So uh, just to show you that this is sadly still relevant. That is basically all I, I have. So, so I know breathing a sigh of relief here probably, but, uh, Thank you again for your time and attention. I know I had to go through some stuff relatively quickly, so I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I will post a copy of my slides, except for the except for the one with the video on it, on uh, Cold War and Internal Security Collection blog. Um, that kind of is sort of the source of how I got into this research. That and how I have it that I have a master's in Russian and Soviet history and. The fact that I have a collection that allows me to explore those issues, kind of. And thank you again here to the Lopez Library and its medical history collection for allowing me this opportunity. And thanks to all of you for here or online for your time and attention. Once again, I hope this has been helpful, useful, interesting, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. audience and then um, everyone who's out there online can submit theirs and we'll get to you shortly. Uh, I found the the insect biological warfare interesting because they stole it from Jack London mm -hmm. who uh, I remember a collection of short stories he had one where the French and other Europeans end up in conflict with the Chinese okay and they resort to flying planes deep into China and dropping glass vials mm. 
Okay. And so that okay. was 1915, 1920. It's sort wow. of, it's kind of a futuristic thing because yeah. the plane was pretty new then. But, yes. but I remember that vividly that story in a collection. I used to read Jack London all the time. Okay, that's that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. I mean, that sort of sound reminds me of sort of H.G. Wells, The Shape of Things to Come, whereas like you have this Air Force that, that like in the post-apocalyptic, post-world, Second World War, apocalyptic Second World War, where it's like this Air Force flies over the world keeping keeping peace, if you will. And it's like, there were, it, I mean, that's sort of like, the, that's actually what the Japanese did on a number of occasions in World War II in China, but it didn't work quite as effectively as they hoped in some cases. That's one of those things that it's not really, it's like, again, to use that H.G. Wells metaphor, like the shape of things to come, he sort of pictured air power in the 19, writing in like the 1920s, I believe, the way that we thought of the way we think of nuclear weapons today, there's this sort of unstoppable, all devastating thing. And it wasn't wasn't quite that effective. And the same thing with the Jap as hor horrific and devastating as it was, it wasn't as effective as it as it theoretically might have been. Sometimes those vi the they dropped like the little bombs or glass vials of insects and you know, nothing would happen or there'd be limited outbreaks or no outbreaks. Or in one case, uh, they caused a cholera outbreak, but then it hung around long enough for their own troops to arrive and they were infected by the cholera. So, yeah, I mean, it's again, that's it's, it's biological warfare has traditionally been it, it's not chance warfare. The wind can change. Exactly. Exactly. When I was when you were talking about the Korean War and all of these bombings with uh, pamphlets and insects and such, yeah, and I'm thinking, can't you, as the as China and the North Korea, be accused of being very ineffective in in chasing the the American airplanes away? I mean. To me, it you know it seemed could that many be getting through whatever yeah. shields you have. Well, it does not reflect well on your country. No, I mean it's one of those things where the North Koreans didn't have much of an air force. The Chinese were still working on their own air force. They did have Soviet air support in the Korean War. There was a force of so roughly 200 Soviet aircraft that provided air cover over part of North Korea, Manchuria and the northern part of North Korea from like 51 on. And so they, the Soviets regularly rotated planes and pilots out. So there were actually instances in the Korean War where there were actually instances in the world in the Cold War where American and Soviet forces engaged in combat. And this was the primary example, US and Soviet planes tangling over North Korea. But yeah, the, the, that was Stalin limited how much the Soviets would be directly involved. And the Chinese and North Koreans themselves, the Soviets helped tried to help them develop their own air forces, but it wasn't really the US had air superiority. So there wasn't much they could do. I mean, it's yeah, the U I mean the US the U.S. basically conducted a a more severe strategic bombing campaign over North Korea than we did over either Germany or Japan in World War II. Basically, every community was basically flattened, for lack of a better word. And one of the reasons they dropped the leaflets was to to kind of like say, you know, to warn, to try to warn civilians to clear out. Though how much of an effect that had, it's hard to say. But yeah, so. Uh, but yeah, there's no way they could have these. The the as far as the the bio, the air campaign in terms of the biological warfare air campaign they were alleging, there was no way that could have been kept secret because it would have involved hundreds of aircraft and hundreds of air crew, and the U.S. According to the scholars who've studied U.S. biological warfare program, and there was such a program, there was no way they had the capability at that time. It wasn't until after the Korean War that. The U.S. developed a biological, of an effective biological warfare capability that they kept through the end of the 1960s. 
So does that, okay. So I have a question that it's okay if um, you don't know the answer because sure. it's kind of adjacent topic, but sure. back to the COVID-19 thing, because yeah. it was really interesting to me um, when you were describing those other campaigns. And then I, I remember I, I lived on Facebook and saw a lot of this stuff like popping up there about yes. conspiracy and things. Do you, Have you ever had a sense or studied this at all of like where some of that was coming from other than like fringe groups? Was there like a particular country that was trying to sway a, a opinion against China or... Um, any ideas? Yes. I mean, there was, on the one hand, yes, there was. We know that the Russians and the Chinese, in fact, did try to uh, spread conspiracy theories that COVID actually came originally from the U.S., as well as spread conspiracy theories about the effectiveness or the dangers of COVID vaccines. So, but there were also, like, essentially anti-Chinese conspiracy theories. There were there were people who, you know, there you might be able to make an argument that COVID escaped from a, a laboratory in Wuhan, but it, it the anyone who, who's I anyone I've read who's knowledgeable at all about this says there's no way it was created by it was man made, but there are still people who make that argument. And uh I don't know, maybe in some cases they do have an anti Chinese or sort of a right wing agenda or just general conspiracy theorists. Nicholson Baker, who wrote a book in 2020, aptly, ironically, but aptly named Baseless, in which he tries to validate the communist biological warfare charges during the Korean War and add a few of his own, uh, has also come out with an article in which he, he insists that not only did COVID escape from a lab, but he believes, he can't prove it, but he believes that these are roughly his words, that it was man-made, but he can't prove it. He just, he just, he just thinks it's, he can't prove it, but he just, that's what he thinks for whatever little that's worth. Sorry. I'm not a fan of his. Um, do you think with like social media and stuff, it's going to get harder to tell where some of these conspiracy theories are coming from with um, like if it is an active measure, so to speak, or if it's something else? Yes, I mean, very much so. I mean, uh, the thing about the current, the social media environment is that these kind of campaigns can spread far more quickly than they did in the 1980s. Uh, you know, you don't have to take out, you don't have to take out an article in the Indian newspaper. You don't have to like go through this extensive, you know, you could just have Jakob Siegel go on Twitter and, and you could, well, especially now, sorry, but uh, anyway, he could go out and spread his, you know, comments. Uh, yes, and they, they're, there have been studies in which they're able to tell that certain accounts are bot accounts and able to trace them back to Russian sources or to other state affiliated sources. But again, there's also been a, there is something of a tendency to, to maybe exaggerate that at times and to say that everything's a bot and everyone's a Russian bot. And you have to be careful of that because there are multiple sources and multiple multiple factors coming together and that's actually kind of in some ways what the russians want they they want this environment in which no one knows what the truth is and they're not the only ones sadly who want that so <clears throat> you have some ways sort of shared certain parties have shared interests in and i don't want to make it out to be like a nefarious what would have formed once been a smoke-filled room or smoke-filled zoom meeting or something but just uh, there can be confluence of, of interest and multiple sources for misinformation and disinformation and multiple motivations for it. So that that makes and again, the social media facilitates that in a way that like late 20th century media really quite did not.
talk listening to this. It reminds me of the first Western vaccinations, which were for smallpox and all of the concerns. Um, which I and you know, if I were there too at that time, I'm certain I would have had concerns too. But there's a wonderful cartoon where people who have had smallpox vaccine, which was just which was derived from cows, cowpox, they're they're the society people or looking society looking people who are developing cow parts. So uh and I'm sure I would have, you know, been hesitant too. So because it it seems so different and new, but um, and that wasn't necessarily disinformation. As some as you know, not not knowing what was going on behind yeah. the scenes. More like ignorance or misinformation. Fear of the unknown. Yeah, exactly. Fear of the exactly. unknown, which is exactly. You know, no, I I don't want foreign stuff put in my body yes if unless there's a very good reason for thinking it's going to help but this is all i mean it's very much yes. historical yes i mean i'll just add to that i mean as someone who once had smallpox vaccine and not a lot of fun but uh anyway i'll spare you the description but i, I to think of disinformation you have to think of it as it's not guaranteed to work. It has to be, it's, think of it in some ways like, like planting or like sowing seeds. The ground has to be fertile. There has to be something there to allow those seeds to grow. And so it, it builds on pre-existing, pre-existing phenomena, pre-existing fears, suspicions. So it's not just, you can't just create this fear out of whole cloth. There has to be something there. That's why, for example, so many Soviet, now Russian, active measures efforts have been much more successful in the developing world because, for example, things like the legacy of Western colonialism and things like that. So there's that history and that memory that their pre people are often predisposed to, to think the worst of, of Western countries, regardless of the circumstances. So, yeah, so that... You know, again, that's uh, that's a good point and a very key thing to keep in mind. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, virtually and in person. And I'd like to thank uh, David again for speaking with us. And have a good have a good evening.